So, to introduce Tony, I could say he's the self-proclaimed bard of the Blue Dog Cafe, that he's a professor at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, that he teaches teachers how to teach writing and how to write themselves, and that he works very hard in our community and beyond um, doing this work that I know he believes is a vocation beyond merely a job. Uh, he has a recent chapbook out from Yellow Flight Press, which he will be reading from tonight. But I have a little surprise for him. <laughs> Uh, several years ago, maybe 2006, we met at a Thai restaurant for a buffet lunch, and and um, Toby was extraordinarily late, so I so I wrote this this poem. You do lunch well for Toby. I deconstruct my spring roll with one fork time. Swirl a cucumber in peanut sauce. It's 12.15 p.m. The date was 11. You appear like a dragon. The sign enters behind you, links you with heat. The waitress is caught in your burn. Her new dentures aren't well fitted. Her lips drag a smile. Her eyes never leave you because she knows your old loves. She would be your mother or more if you let her. You say everything is good except the seven law eggs. I eat one and I can't stop farting. We are too loud, too happy. Laughter draws attention. The Indians curse into their plates. The water girl is a spy. The babies are all ears. Is it okay to flirt with the long hair and blonde in the buffet line? I say yes, of course. She could be your island mate after the shipwreck. You write a note to book a cruise. You write a note to plot a shipwreck near an island. Got it. Toby Gasper. <laughs> The first chapbook I have is Anatomy of a Ghost and Other Poems Not About You. Um, and it opens with a haiku, which was written in the Bukowski room of the Royal Street Inn in New Orleans. Back in the bayou, we need seven syllables for Bloody Merits. And this is, this could be the night when our 95 miles an hour down the alleyways of love and fear, which is a, a line from Tom Russell that we can drift off from, from Jerry Reader. This could be the night when my spine finally unbuckles. This could be the night when lust won't stop spilling from sweat-drenched pores. Actually, that's beer-drenched pores. This could be the night when the bartender doubles every drink without telling anyone. This could be the night when the singer plays for another half hour after the place is empty, just for the two of us. This could be the night when I finally figure out why I didn't follow you into the jungle. My theories? One, because I was blinded by your white belly under midnight moon. Two, because Muddy bodies have taught me to distrust what's under the surface. Three, because I am blind. This could be the night when after several cheap beers and maybe a shot or two of even cheaper bourbon, I go back for Rambo, chase him down the alleys of Paris, cradle his head in my arms, kiss his delicate lips, feel his tongue arch under every vowel, Jealously watch out for Verlaine, who skulks around every corner, and beg him, as only a future ear can. Why will you stop writing? Why? To which he steers, tosses his head. Why will you start? Why? This could be the night when I realize that if this beer could be you, then that would leave me with you pounding inside me. This could be the night when Satan spit stops polishing my eyes. This could be the night when I finally stop checking my watch. 
to see the time, the date, and stop wondering where you might be, what you might be thinking. This could be the night when metaphor, flashing teeth, smooth neck, dissolves into pierced skin, rushing blood, ripped spine, and the stark intrusion of reality. This could be the night when I find the words before they are formed in the fire of nerve and blood. This could be the night when I stop buying drinks for women who aren't going to sleep with me. This could be the night when I explain to you how these poems emerge. A little restlessness, twisted sheets, and ink-stained hands gripping your words too tight. This could be the night when I finally write those late night notes to women I've never slept with but wanted to. This could be the night when I finally whisper to you do you know why I don't even bother writing anymore? How can I with you in the world breathing? This could be the night when you finally believe in the beauty I saw in you. This could be the night when you finally understand that I never believed in the treacherous swirl of your eyes. This could be the night when I touched your ass if you patch it. This could be the night when I remember the sizzling electric of your blue eyes, awake, aware, your spindling, hair spindling over shoulder tattoo. This could be the night when I relive, relive over and over slow tugs on the Guinness, Irish car bombs, and your sweet, cold energy. This could be the night when I admit there's a new voice slipping through the cracks. This could be the night when you keep emerging in ways you will never understand. This could be the night when finally, above all, the moon's translucent eggshell cracks, spills secrets, promising that your forget-me-not eyes will finally find mine. They're, they're three points. They're sort of linked to go together. Uh, first one's really short, and then the others are not quite as short. Um, and this one I'm going to do for It's called Going In Through the Back Door of Prison. And it's from a, um, a short word that we said it in the Charles of the Documentary. He was talking about uh, teaching it in the world. And I think you're right, that's the first line from her. From her. You do death well. You tell me, not seeking an apprenticeship, but simply because you know I've been doing it longer. Look at this snapshot, I tell you, drawing your eyes into mine. It was taken the day before you died, silhouetting an awkward 16-year-old. You avert your dormant volcano eyes Cradle your growth forever nine. Buried in a Pompeii, neither of us can explain. <clears throat> and this is, um, uh, I guess, the, the, the title of this, Anatomy of the Ghost. Starts with the Richard Thompson line. He says, the ghost that you walks. One, it doesn't walk, it tiptoes. Catlike, finding new hiding places every day. Two, a chilled wind clouds from your mouth, staccato silences. Three, nothing withstands the brittle architecture of your absence. Four, the words only sputter now, rarely stain the page, but tonight I feel something rather. Forcing down my spine. Oh, wait, it's not a poem. It's only your memory haunting my last refuge. Five, Pittsburgh, November. I sit sipping iced tea at a Pepto baby. Pepto bismol baby, our little doctor that smells like our last breakfast together. 
After a dizzy Sunday morning of lazy, famished love making, we slow our bloodstream with spicy bloody berries and undercooked bacon. I keep the receipt from that morning with many others, but I think I'll throw this one away. Six, from the edge of the bed, still rumpled from your fetal curl, I hear you whisper, as you did only once, I love you, I love you, I love you. Then evaporate from this house of cards you never call home. Seven, you used to help me prop up the corner of this bar, dripping over every drink, peeling beer bottle labels, smiling when I caught a glimpse of you glimpsing me. Eight, she has your hair, and when she walked in, my heart did a thing, but not the thing. Her eyes tell a different story. Yours spoke centuries. Hers haven't even soaked up today. Nine. The bartender has the same slow swerve in her hips you did. I can watch her every Monday, Friday, and Saturday. I don't know when or where you will be. Ten. You're there in the crescent moon in every bruised side. Eleven. The first time you slept with me, you brought over a bottle of Jim Bean Black. We drained it. I nestled it on a shelf. I doubt you ever noticed. Twelve. You swooped unexpectedly around the corner. Flesh this time, but less breathing than your ghost shelf. <coughs> Uh, Starts with the rain and carver line. Would I live my life over again? Make the same unforgivable mistakes? Yes. Given half a chance. Yes. This love is being dismantled. Bar by bar, kiss by kiss, argument by argument, movie by movie, souvenir by souvenir, toothbrush by toothbrush, promise by promise. This love echoes our carrying songs from you. I can't take my eyes off of you. I can't take my eyes off of you. I can't take my mind off of you to kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, get it out, get it out, get it out, get your freaking voice out of my head. This love wobbles under the nauseous inertia of words unspoken. This love traces its tongue against dragonfly skulls. This love's spine is brittle. This love is haunted sleep. This love is vampire breath on a mirror. This love was never photographed. This love screams that you were supposed to be gone. This love couldn't withstand your 80 proof eyes. This love couldn't solve the mathematics of accidental collision. This love is not dead. This love never lived. <laughs> so I'm going to do uh, the new chapbook, which um, we have copies for sale. Talk to Jane uh, after the uh, bar coasters. Conveniently fits right in your back pocket. Um, <laughs> Or whatever. Um, it's, a, it's from a long series of, of, of uh, uh, sketches uh, of poems that were written literally on the backs of war coasters or, or cocktail napkins. Um, so it's, it's just sort of a collection of five of them. <coughs> uh, this is, uh, I think, Kimberly's favorite war coaster number one. Red used to be my favorite color before gray before black, before vodka. This is number seven. Soap bar napkins, it's nearly midnight and still 90 degrees. Humidity soaks my eyes, and you're sitting somewhere in Norway tonight, pregnant, holding a glass of nothing. Number 16, which is one of my promotional fire. Jukebox song. Paid for, but never heard. Number 22. I don't think I can handle New Orleans again. Though I'm cautious, and 
in using a drowning metaphor. And number 37, the sweet swirl of the you next to me kaleidoscope brushed elbow signatures. <laughs> Few more I'm sure you sufficiently impressed. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, June 1983. <clears throat> the last time I saw my brother alive, he sat at mom's kitchen counter drinking afternoon coffee. He was on break from work from underemployment as a copy machine repairman. This was the summer before my senior year of high school. The previous weekend, my brother helped our dad install a ceiling fan in the living room. It's hung swell throughout the house. This was 1983, June. The hungry Louisiana sun kept me inside most afternoons, and though I didn't drink coffee, I pulled up a chair, uninvited, joined them at the kitchen counter. Mom bored me about anyway. This was an afternoon that was meant to be ordinary. Nothing brilliant. I didn't say much at the kitchen counter. I don't think they did either. This was a Tuesday afternoon. My brother didn't call for a visit. Dad hadn't retired yet, so he wasn't home. Mom refilled their cups several times. Now this is the summer of unremembering, of confined silences, watching coffee cool, then grow cold. This one's, uh, it, it, it doesn't have a title yet. It's loosely down to the ceiling with Jacqueline Dupre in the wheelchair. Jacqueline Dupre was um, the, the most renowned cellist in the world, and she was stricken down with um, um, ALS. So uh, basically, she's got this amazing gift that she couldn't use anymore because her body couldn't uh, play the instrument. <clears throat> and for whatever reason, her body couldn't play the I only knew my grandfather as a burden. The strokes he started having at 55 paralyzed the left side of his body, left him a limp hulk, reduced him to dissonant grunts. Every few months we took him from that nursing home that smelled of dying, drove him to the camp he rented alongside my dad's, wrestled him into a rocking chair where he'd stare for hours at Bayou Benoit. Recently, my sister assured me that while she's ready to leave this world any time, our grandfather had a steely will to live, and he was too mean to die. When he did, I was away for the weekend on a high school field trip. My parents said they didn't want to bother me with the news. Only now, as I hear my father begin to repeat himself, begin to misname things, even his own children, do I wonder what words are buried in my grandfather's 30 years of aphasia what demons nestled in electrician limbs to use to transplant? This one takes on a kind of new residence for me. I was a few years ago, but about a week ago, um, I was moving the, uh, the, the trash can, the blue thing out the curb in the middle of the day. And um, when I moved it, I stepped barefoot. I said, that doesn't feel right. And turned around. It was a nice snake I just stepped on. Um, that was apparently just a king snake, right? <laughs> but didn't know the time. So this is called king snake. When I was young, there were snakes. Then there were snakes. Mark, my best friend, and I here the stretch through neighboring fields of thistle and cattails, wondering if we'd ever spot any of the ones we pour over in the illustrated encyclopedias my mom bought for me with green stamps. Red and yellow kill a fellow, red and black, friendly jack. My dad killed a water moccasin once, one that slid right into our backyard. Our three rat terriers sounding an alarm that we knew wasn't just 
a stray dog or cat crossing the property line. Dad explained to us how you could tell it was poisonous, how you could tell it wasn't just a plain old water snake. Of course, I already knew this from the illustrated encyclopedias that were brought home for me, but I never quite figured out how anyone was supposed to get close enough to see the pits around the snake's eyes or coax it into opening its mouth. Besides, Mark and I knew that at best we'd stumble upon a shy coral snake, if we were lucky, but all we ever saw was the occasional king snake. Some assorted rat or garter snakes, and even a couple I never could find in those illustrated encyclopedias my mom brought with her with green stamps. At some point, of course, we stopped looking at things that once fascinated us. Stop trying trying to identify the markings on things that slither by. We realize there is little difference between things anyway. That most things have the capacity to kill us if we let them get close enough. After Hurricane Gustav, while helping my dad pile debris curbside, I saw Mark for the first time in years. He'd come to check on his late parents' property uh, that his niece now owned, and he wandered over to check on my dad on his property. We talked about things that men who once poked around with snakes together do. That is, we talked about the hurricane, about how lucky we all were. I never mentioned, of course, that in my 41st year, I would die of a snake bite, venomous or not. And just a couple more. Uh, this is uh, this was actually written right at Little Off Cafe. It's an unofficial board there, right? I think James did that. With a with a lawyer friend of mine. Uh, it's called Dinner for Three. It always starts with the eyes. You say, asking why mine spin away every time we speak. People will never believe you. Your law school training assures me if you can't look them in the eye, or at least the eyebrows, you say, slipping your wedding band off, they'll never know the difference. <laughs> oh, these are, um, I don't have any, but um, these are actually her row illustrations that go with these uh, lot sides. Um, maybe we'll get some more of those friends soon. Uh, this is Lot's wife at Carthage. If you remember, uh, all right, Lot was told to, uh, to not look. Lot's wife was told to not look back. Um, Mora and she did, and Miller saw all that in Carthage. Um, in uh, about those betting where he says the world has gone black before my eyes, and Robert Lowell, who ran Carthage, quote, says, "Yet why not say what?" Why not recall that purple August night when over dinner your chocolate eyes drip the world no longer in ruins? Why not tell how you arched your hungry tongue your every word dissolving desire like salt? Why not speak about how your promises crumble universes in our open palms, lifelines etched in chalky futures? Why not remember when later that night we stumbled from opposite sides into your bed, our shadows never touching? <clears throat> Why not ask what it means to dream three times in one night about someone sleeping next to you? Why not say what happened when you lumbered out of bed early the next morning, and I managed to unstable my eyes for a monosyllabic moment, I caught you, tossing a fossilized glance over your right shoulder, like some shock-worn muse, fumbling for loose change. <laughs> and I'll wrap things up with one I wrote uh, right down the road here at the Ridge with um, our National Writing Project, Katie, a summer group, a uh, sort of that project. If you want to hear more about it, I'll talk to you later. <clears throat> Just a phenomenal group of, um, of teachers committed to improving teaching and writing. And it's called On My Detention. One, the water is thick enough to walk on. Two, there are ghosts here beneath the surface. They come up for air, 
drag living secrets with them. Three, sun sinks into muddy bayou grounds. Four, this bayou sinks past houses I grew up in. No one is ever home when I drive by. Five, I stare into the burnt coffee streaming by, see the surface break occasionally with turtles and frogs. I could stare forever and never see what's really underneath. Six cars and trucks hum over the old bridge, a thoughtless plastic grocery bag snags on driftwood. I haven't been swimming in years. Seven. Oak, pine, cypress, willow, dogwood, lying this bayou, some bending over into their own shadows. There are birds. I can hear them, but I don't see any. Eight, my dad went fishing yesterday. Not antique shops huddle in the center of town. I duck into a few, hear ghosts whispering in unfamiliar tongues. And who winds these clocks after dark? Eleven, a Victrola scratches. Twelve, no one is sitting at the bar except the ghosts of ex lovers. They keep checking their watches. Thanks.